Good morning. I'm John Devitt, uh, Chief Executive of Transparency International Ireland, and welcome to the launch of the Corruption Perceptions Index 2021. Uh, the session today will be recorded and be available on our YouTube channel. You'll also have an opportunity to ask questions in the chat or uh, Q&A. And if you'd like to pose a question to uh, the panel in person, please let us know and we'll give you the microphone. Remember that we live in a country with uh, rather strict or shall I say draconian uh, defamation laws. And if names are named, we may need to edit them out of the video before it's posted online. Uh, with the technicality set of the way, I'm delighted to introduce you to today's panel. Uh, we're joined by Dr. Robert Kukusha, uh, uh, Roberto uh, Kukusha, uh, I hope I pronounced your name properly, Roberto, um, who is the man responsible for the publication of the Corruption Perceptions Index at the TI Secretariat in Berlin. He just completed his PhD uh, in Corruption Measurement Tools, and I'll be asking him to uh, share the results with us in a moment. I'm also joined by Dr. Uh, Rob Galanders, Director of the Anti-Corruption uh, Research Center at Dublin City University, who is an economist by training, has done a great deal of work around uh, the e economic uh, impact and multitudinous costs of corruption. Uh, and also joined by my colleague, Catherine Lawler, who is our advocacy and research coordinator and is responsible uh, for the production of some of our uh, research tools, including our National Integrity Index and uh, forthcoming research on money and politics. Roberto, uh, I will firstly turn to you to share the results, if you don't mind. And uh, I think you have a, a PowerPoint, uh, which yes. you're free to share too. Let me okay. So um, thank you, John, for the for the introduction and for having me here um, this morning. Um, it's it's a pleasure to be here on the day of the of the launch of our corruption perceptions index. So again, uh, thank you for having me. Just can someone confirm we're all seeing the presentation? Perfect. All right. So um, as John said, today uh, we're launching our corruption perceptions index, and what I thought I would do is just give you a very quick uh, overview of, uh, well, what the CPI is, a quick refresher of um, our methodology, what the CPI captures and what it doesn't, and then move towards uh, the results and some of the trends that we see um, in this year's um, CPI. So first, um, please remember that uh, the sources, well, the Corruption Perceptions Index is an aggregate uh, indicator of corruption. So none of the data that we put into the index is actually compiled by Transparency International or produced by Transparency International. We simply aggregate existing sources into an index. Um, so um, our methodology has essentially four steps. The first one is the selection of, of these sources. We are uh, limiting the index to 13 since 2012. So 13 sources since 2012 from 12 different organizations. Um, the second step is, of course, since all of the sources come in different scales, we need to rescale the data following statistical formulas. Um, and then this, the third step is simply to calculate the average and also the margins of error. Um, and then this is what we report. So just in terms of quality control, I think it's important to, since we've been surrounded by data scandals and uh, not, not TI, but uh, we have seen the scandal in the World Bank and so on, the way we calculate the index is we have two researchers at Transparency International, one of them being myself and someone else here in the team that calculate the index independently. And at the same time, we also have two researchers outside of TI, um, not belonging, not, not having any ties with the Transparency International Secretariat or the movement, um, also doing these blind calculations of the index. So until all of these four calculations don't match um, um, perfectly, we do not share these results with um, our movement or our chapters who are the next layer, so to speak, of, of quality control. So uh, that's how we uh, work on this. 
as I was mentioning, there are 13 sources that go into the CPI. Uh, most of them get updated on an annual basis. Some of them get updated on a biannual basis, so every two years. Uh, for this year's CPI, 11 of our sources are just new, and two are uh, were not updated this year. Uh, so we're using the ones from uh, 2021. So these two are the Sustainable Governance Indicators and the World Bank CPIA. However, none of these two um, affect uh, the score for Ireland since um, none of these sources covers Ireland, I believe. I would have to double check, but I think these are more for countries in um, developing areas of the world. So um, just as a reminder of what the CPI captures and does not capture, the CPI is an expert measure, well, an, 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 a measurement of corruption based on experts' assessments and business people assessments uh, of public sector corruption. So um, we only include phenomena related to bribery, the diversion of public funds, uh, the so so to speak, the use of office for private gain. So issues like embezzlement, theft of public funds, all of these things would be in there. There are also elements of the quality of anti-corruption regulation that would enter into the index. On the other hand, we have um, a number of issues such as tax fraud, illicit financial flows, um, the role of enablers of corruption, uh, money laundering and private sector corruption that do not um, enter into the index. So um, now moving on to the main findings of the year, um, what we see is not much of a deviation of what we have been seeing over the past few years. And it is that um, um, there is not much progress in the fight against corruption worldwide. So out of the countries that we have in the index, so 180 for the past uh, few years that we've been covering, uh, 86 have made little to no progress in the last 10 years. This does not necessarily mean that the score has not moved. There are always uh, a, a bit of adjustments in the index, like a country can go up one or two points, but this is not necessarily a meaningful change. So we're looking at uh, countries where the, where the change is what one would call statistically significant and only 14% of, of countries fall under this category. Um, the global average remains unchanged for the 10th year in a row. And what we see as well is uh, the link that we're doing this year as a global theme, so to speak, is to link corruption to the issue of protection of civil liberties and human rights. And uh, what we see is that there is indeed a relationship between countries that protect human rights having better control of corruption in general. Um, again, two thirds of countries as last year fall under a, an av under a score of 50 on the CPI and the average, the global average remains at 43. I will not spend too much time on this slide either uh, because uh, I think we all are familiar with the best and worst performers in the index. Um, so we have, um, as you know, our scale is from zero to 100 or 100 is very clean and zero is uh, very corrupt. So um, at the top this year, we have Finland, Denmark, and New Zealand, and at the bottom, Somalia, Syria, and South Sudan. So I think uh, the, the thing to keep in mind is that the countries at the top of the CPI tend to be advanced uh, economies, uh, mostly democratic countries in, in Western Europe and North America. Um, and at the bottom of the index, we have uh, many countries with, uh, where like, with civil unrest or with um, outright conflict and several authoritarian states. So this, um, I think this is just what's important to keep in mind. In terms of regions, we do see that there are like um, differences between the, the, the regions around the world. So again, um, as we have had in the previous years, Western Europe and the European Union stay at the top of the index with an average of 66. And at the bottom, we have Sub-Saharan Africa with an average of 43. Now, um, every year I think we report um, these uh, numbers, but uh, this year we have um, the tenth year is the tenth year that we uh, produce the CPI on a, like, where the scores are comparable. So we also wanted to look a little bit more into the trends and what we see in terms of changes. Um, so um, what we identified is that there are 25 countries where the score has significantly improved, and 23 where it has declined. In the other 134 countries that we have been covering since 2012, there is little to no change in the, in the index. Um, and here are just some examples of the countries where we see improvements um, or decline 
since 2012. I will, um, um, don't, don't worry, we'll talk a little bit more about this. Uh, so you don't have to memorize all of them or read them all now. Um, um, I think what is important to take away from this one is that the Middle East and North Africa region is the only one where we do not see any country improving, uh, but we do have three countries declining, such as Lebanon, Syria, and Yemen. Um, I think one of the issues that is important to keep in mind, and this is a trend that we have been seeing for the past few years, but it really got uh, consolidated, so to speak, or it really crystallized over the past uh, few years, is that several countries that used to top the index, um, such as Canada, the United States, Australia, and Luxembourg, um, have been seeing their scores drop. Um, so we have um, Canada has dropped around 10 points since 2012. The United States has also dropped nine points since 2015. Um, and Australia has dropped a total of 12 points since 2012 as well. So we are seeing um, in many democratic countries, the institutions that are supposed to act as uh, watchdogs or as checks and balances on corruption, we see how these have been put through a significant stress uh, test over the past uh, few years. Um, and these countries are starting to slide down in the, in the index, which is not necessarily good news, since many of these countries were um, at the forefront of the fight against corruption and were very vocal in terms of how um, anti-corruption should be done also in other countries. So um, yeah, this is, this is not great um, in terms of uh, what it means. However, uh, we do have improvements in, in other parts of the, of the world. If we just look at the EU, we have some good news here. Um, countries like Estonia, Latvia, uh, Greece, and Italy uh, continue. Well, uh, Estonia and Latvia have been on, a, on an upward trend uh, for a while now. Uh, and both countries have improved uh, 10 points over the past 10 years. Um, and Greece and Italy have recovered from some of the dip that they took um, after the, the Euro crisis. So now Greece and Italy are also on the way up. Now, if we zoom a little bit out of the EU and look at the rest of the world, there are also a few changes that we see for, you know, for better or worse in, in, around the world. So some of them might not surprise anyone, like the case of uh, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Honduras, where we have had a, well, in the case of Venezuela, there's um, conflict, there's not, there's, there's not really um, uh, a lot, I mean, rule of law is non-existent at the moment. Um, and also in Honduras and Nicaragua, we have had a turn towards authoritarianism. Um, and Canada, as I mentioned earlier, is, is uh, one of the cases of our uh, top countries that have started, have started to decline. Um, on the positive side, on the good news, so to speak, uh, we do see also some changes, uh, some positive developments in countries like Armenia, Ethiopia, Angola, and South Korea. So South Korea is one of those countries that despite being at the, already at a very high um, uh, score, they were in the mid 50s, so just uh, around the mid 50s, it's now uh, has improved uh, eight points just in the past uh, five years. Um, and yes, like I was mentioning earlier this year, we wanted to use the launch to bring attention to the issue of uh, the role of human rights and civil liberties in the fight against corruption. Um, I think we do not only fight corruption for the sake of fighting corruption, but also because um, it is important uh, for the protection of human rights. At the same time, um, protecting human rights is a great way to also fight corruption. If uh, certain freedoms, such as the freedom of association, or the freedom of expression are not protected in a country, it is much easier to get away with, um, with acts of corruption. Uh, it is much easier to avoid accountability when this happens. It is much easier to keep corruption hidden. So that is, I think, what uh, the link between um, these two phenomena are. And what we do see, this is just a scatter plot checking, um, like just correlating um, the Corruption Perceptions Index 27, 2021 with the uh, Civil Liberties Index. Um, and what we see is that there is a positive correlation. It is not the cleanest of correlations, and that is also something that must be said. Um, and part of this is the opposite narrative of what, to what I just said in terms of some of the democracies that were at the top of the index declining. We're also starting to see some autocratic regimes um, getting better and better at cracking down on corruption through very authoritarian and not necessarily 
um, um, I mean, yeah, through some very authoritarian methods that, uh, you know, do uh, infringe on people's uh, civil liberties and human rights. So it's not a way. Um, and of course, in these cases, the fight against corruption can also be easily politicized. So um, uh, while we do see a decline in the levels of corruption in some of these countries, um, and some of them would include uh, places like the United Arab Emirates or Saudi Arabia, um, even China to a certain extent, um, this is not necessarily the best way to proceed and fighting corruption. So uh, the other thing that we that we are trying to raise awareness, of, like that we're trying to to highlight, is that in countries where corruption is rampant or uh, systematic, uh, it is also very dangerous to stand up for human rights and to stand up for civil liberties. So out of the 313 um, human rights activists and anti-corruption activists that have been killed around the world, that were killed around the world in 2021. 98% uh, of them were killed in countries where the CPI score uh, was below the average of um, 45. So uh, this just is to show how dangerous it can be to advocate for some of the issues like anti-corruption or the protection of human rights in some of these areas. And, and just to recap and sum up and not take more, uh, more of your time with this, um, uh, I think that the, the three main messages here is that um, anti-corruption progress has stagnated or there are only a few uh, countries where we see progress. Um, the second point is that some of the countries at the top of the index are slowly regressing, which is, I think, also a, um, an important message for countries at the top of the index to not let the institutions decay. It is very important to, even if you're at the top of the index, um, stay on top of this and continue to strengthen your institutions and working on anti-corruption. Even if um, you believe it is not happening anymore, it is important to have those institutions in place to avoid institutional decay and democratic backslide. Um, and uh, finally, it's worth remembering that strengthening human rights and promoting civil liberties is one of the best ways also to fight corruption and keep it under control. So that's it from my side. I hope I didn't speak for too long. Um, and I hand back to John. Thanks, Roberto. And Jane, I might ask you if you can give me control of the screen so I can just share the, some more details on Ireland's results here. Um, I will, uh, it's great, thanks. I just wanna make sure I have the, Right one, and you can see Ireland's page on the international website, I hope. And the trends of since um, we began comparing results, I think we began, was it from 2012, Roberto? I thought it was a little bit later, 2015, but it could be. Yeah, results are comparable from 2012, yeah. 2012, okay, great. Mm -hmm. So um, in 2012, uh, a year after the Moriarty Tribunal was published in the year that the Mahan Tribunal was published, Ireland received its lowest score um, at any point since I think the, the, the uh, Ireland was included in the index of 69. Its score has increased uh, since then to 74. I made a mistake, by the way, when we issued the press release and the information on our website is slightly incorrect. I don't know how this happened, but Ireland is ranked for what it's worth in 13th, not 14th place. So uh, we may need to contact the news desks this morning uh, to let them know and correct the Irish Times opinion piece, which some of you might have um, read this morning, asking how corrupt is Ireland, uh, which leads me on nicely to Rob. Um, Rob, what, the, what do these results say about Ireland? How, how corrupt is it? Is this, uh, is this marginal improvement good news? Uh, are you indifferent to it? Does it make much difference? I, I'm, uh, I'm both. To some extent, I think it is. It's good news, but also, uh, you know, it, it's not the, the be all and end all. Should take the opportunity, by the way, and I promise that neither Roberto nor John uh, bribed me to say this, but we are uh, generally lucky to have organizations like TI in the world. It's worth noting on a day like this when they launched their kind of flagship project, 
how important it is to uh, to have organizations like TI in the world and DI Ireland in Ireland. Um, my views on the CPI, John, are that it's great, uh, but uh, and you know it's great because it has enabled us to learn a lot about corruption around the world, um, and it's great for starting conversations such as this. Uh, but it it does have limitations, and to be fair, as Roberto pointed out in his talk there. Um, you know, TI are not shy about the limitations. It's, it's somewhat, to some extent, the limitations are, 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 are ignored by, by some people who, who are using the same this. I mean, they, before I talk about specifics, <clears throat> uh, kind of a local and a global sense, my, my thoughts having seen the index for, for, for a few hours now, um, the limitations largely come down to the fact that it doesn't measure everything, as Roberto acknowledged. Uh, and it also, you know, suffers from perception biases. We can see this um, in, in kind of studies around the world. And sometimes the, the experts whose opinions inform these, um, the, 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 the components of the TI index, you know, they, they sometimes operate off the model that they have running in their head about what a corrupt country looks at like because corruption is hard to measure. And that can be problematic. And it also has the potential to, to set up somewhat um, perverse incentives to, to not reform uh, or not to be transparent uh, for fear that when things get out into the public sphere, they'll influence negatively the TI uh, index. I mean, it, it remind, it, Roberto noted that the, the World Bank has had problems with its one of its flagship uh, products, the Doing Business Index. Reminded of a, a, a colleague of mine who's doing advice uh, uh, on tax policy um, in, in, in a country that will remain nameless. And when she suggested that they reform an element of their tax process, she was told they couldn't possibly do that because it would hurt them on the World Bank's ease of uh, paying taxes index. And this was something that would have kind of closed off the potential for criminals to launder money. So there, you know, when you measure things, you have to be very careful that they don't become um, uh, bad incentives. But for all that, I mean, it is, as I said, great that we have the CPI because it does allow us to have a look at that, what's going on and kind of assess our, pro our progress. Um, and it is, you know, it, you know, there is evidence that, you know, doing well on corruption perceptions is, is important in terms of how much investment you attract from abroad. Um, whether those perceptions are accurate or not, they seem to be something that investors operate on. So it's good from that sense. The thing to, 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 to I think that's, that's worth noting is that for a very small country like Ireland, um, it's not all that clear that small, re relatively small uh, cases of anti-corruption success or failure will be picked up by international uh, observers. Um, and so while it's great that we improve on the CPI uh, in as far as it goes, and um, we have to remember there's a lot of small things that we could and should do that might not get international attention but would you know substantially improve all of our lives and protect us from from from, from corruption and you know the the the, the recently published Hamilton report uh, review I think is a is a really good um, roadmap into the kind of things we could do and that's a long old document that I won't go into it all but you know issues of resources anti corruption resources and, and coordination and the thing that tickles me as an economist is you know the idea that we collect better data within Ireland. And we analyze that in a more rigorous way than we might have done previously. Um, because ultimately, we do need a lot of different measures of corruption. It's hard to measure, it's hard to observe, it's secretive, it's criminal. Uh, people aren't all that keen to reveal it. But also, <clears throat> you know, different types of corruption affect different types of people differently. Uh, you know, there's big literature that says corruption tends to, you know, the particular burdens of corruption fall on people who are already vulnerable, be they people who are. Um, in communities that have particular problems with drugs and crime and, and police who are, you know, looking the other way for, for bribes, um, be it um, um, people who are um, victims of sextortion when they try and cross borders. It, it is all different types of corruption that might not be the kinds of things that business experts and business intelligent people um, are thinking about when they're asked how corrupt a country is. And I think it's very important that we we have these kind of micro measures uh, of corruption. Um, and we do need to continue, I think, uh, to, to, to close off opportunities for corruption. I mean, compared to some of our, our, our comparative countries, 
uh, Ireland didn't have a bad pandemic in the sense of, of, of corruption, at least as far as we know. We haven't seen too many examples of the kind of uh, cronyism or sleaze, as, as some of our friends call it, affecting the public awarding of contracts, as, at least so far, we don't know. But we did see that some, you know, in the case of the ventilators that were bought, um, the HSE was prepared for to bypass its own procedures and, and corruption or procurement red flags out of a, a genuine desperate need. But the issue there is that that is exposed kind of a weakness that we might have uh, that could be exploited by, by corrupt actors down the line. So we need to continue to, to, to pick up um, um, when we see kind of weaknesses like this, it's important that we, we close them off because it's much better to stop yourself uh, becoming a corrupt country, much easier to stop yourself becoming a corrupt country than it is to come back from the other direction. And we should, we should bear that in mind. Um, one more kind of local point maybe is the, the, the corruption data about Ireland that bothers me the most is not from the CPI. Well, not why would that bother me? It's an improvement. But the, the, the data I think about the most is the Eurobarometer surveys of public attitudes to corruption uh, uh, um, in, in Ireland. Now, it's only, you know, they're very high by union standards. Most people agreed it's not okay. The mass majority of people said, read, corruption is a bad thing. You shouldn't do it. But there is the beginnings of a trend downwards in those, uh, in those data. And you have to watch carefully the next issue of the Eurobarometer uh, corruption module to see if that's a, a continuing trend. And the, as I said, the danger there is that it's much easier to, to, to fall into being a corrupt country than it is to go the other way. And one of the most powerful things we have to protect ourselves from, from corruption is a strong public norm. It's like a, a, you know, an immune system uh, against corruption. And once people are prepared to act corruptly, uh, or think it's not such a big deal that kind of the, the hurdle, uh, the hurdle has been cleared. Um, and, you know, other, other things we saw that might speak to that being a problem is, you know, the, the reports of significant queue jumping um, when it came to, to receiving the vaccine, um, uh, the, the COVID vaccine. It, it's large numbers of civil servants were indeed uh, prepared to, you know, tap into the HEC system they had access to, to jump the queue. By some, by some people would consider that to be a form of, uh, of corruption, abuse of access to that system to benefit themselves. And if that was widespread, we might not have quite the strong uh, public service norms that we thought we did. Um, and then one other thing about the, 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 the kind of the interplay of the CPI with uh, norms is, if we're gonna protect our norms, it's important that we have a kind of an honest and realistic conversation <clears throat> about how corrupt or, or clean a country is. If we forever are running around saying this is a, a super corrupt country, uh, everyone's corrupt, everything is motivated and driven by corruption, that will chip away at people's reluctance to get involved in corruption themselves. If you think one of the ways we you know, if you see this around the world, one of the ways people justify acting corruptly to themselves is through the notion that everybody is doing it. And you know what evidence we have, not everybody is doing it in Ireland. We need to have a kind of an honest conversation about that. And point out corruption and weaknesses where they are there, um, but not allow the um, not allow the rhetoric to get out of hand because it will it will poison our norms. Um, so there are some of the local um, thoughts I had, John. I'm not sure if they quite answered your question. Uh, I had some thoughts about the kind of the global situation. It is very important, I think, that uh, TI is pointing out the links between corruption and human rights violations and civil liberties. Um, it's not just the case, though, I think that uh, it's harder to fight corruption where you have repressed civil liberties. Uh, corruption, we have evidence, is a driver of all kinds of bad behavior at the individual and state level. We've seen um, work, work that we did at the, the Anti-Corruption Research Center uh, last year, which is available open access uh, on the DC website. And um, we showed that people who've experienced corruption are more likely to think that domestic, political, and interpersonal violence is justifiable and kind of chips away at people's moral foundations for how they behave. Um, and once, you know, once that process gets going again, it's, uh, it, it can be hard, hard to arrest. And it goes for all the SDGs. I mean, there's, there's evidence um, certainly from uh, across social science and indeed there's a kind of good review paper uh, from when we were talking about the Millennium Development Goals uh, that showed how uh, corruption makes it much more difficult to achieve all of these kind of international targets that we quite rightly set for ourselves. And then this is the final rambling thought I have, John, I promise. Um, 
is, you know, the, the CPI is, is, is very useful, as I said, but <clears throat> the way it's presented has one limitation, I think, that we're all seeing play out uh, uh, in Ukraine at the moment, or more accurately in Russia at the moment. The idea that, you know, we look at a map and we see there's these clearly delineated boxes of corruption uh, is dangerous because corruption spills over. Corruption in one country affects us all. Um, that, you know, kleptocracies are a danger to everybody in the world. Uh, and we need to maybe think more about how corrupt um, the world is and stop focusing on, on, on league tables because clean countries can benefit and enable the, the business of kleptocracy. Um, and ultimately, my suspicion is, and I think there's good evidence for this, um, that they become infected um, by, by the corruption. So we need, to, we need to pay careful attention to global corruption and not focus too much on, um, on, on you know, very useful, but, but potentially misleading uh, uh, charts and, and tables. So they're my, um, they're my main thoughts, having had a look at the index. Uh, thanks. thanks, thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, and I, I think we make we make this point clearly too today in in, in both our, the, the the statement we published and the the article I wrote for the Irish Times today that we have a responsibility to meet in, in tackling corruption internationally that we've yet to shake off a reputation as so called Wild West of European finance in part because. We've been so successful in attracting foreign capital, but we have we are incapable of detecting and uh, and acting on reports of or concerns related to dirty money coming into this country. And unless we get to grips with the flow of dirty money, uh, we won't be able to address many of the other the, the world's other many other uh, intractable problems including climate change as i point out uh, unless we uh, are able to stem the tide of stolen money from resource rich countries kleptocrats have no reason to, to move to sustainable energy when they're profiting from from their own oil and gas reserves uh, or to protect natural habitats when uh, bribes are paid to 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 turn uh, rainforest into farmland to feed you know livestock so uh, that that money is coming through uh, financial capitals including dublin london new york singapore you name it uh, and um, we need to get to grips with that problem as well but um uh, like i say in, in the article too i think rather than dwell on uh, the, the question how corrupt is ireland i'd ask what are we doing to stop it? And, and Catherine, you've been working with us now for what eight months. You've you've been responsible for uh, coordinating our our national integrity index series, and you're also working on a study on money and politics. I just turn to you and, and ask you if you have if you want to if you have time time to 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 briefly go through some of that work, and I'd ask you. If, if you have any uh, one conclusion to draw from from your time with us so far, is there, is there any one observation yeah, um, um, rising from the work that that you'd like to share? But if you if you want to, do you have um, a PowerPoint you wanted to? I do not share? have a PowerPoint, um, but um, just briefly to go over the the main research project that that we're doing is the National Integrity Index, which has. Um, already published three reports it looks at um, the disclosure practices of different sectors so there's been one on local authorities one on the private sector and one on semi-state companies and and public universities um, and as has been touched on obviously it's difficult to measure actual corruption so um, it's a, a measure of the uh, disclosure and transparency that these that various organizations have around their organizational structure, their corporate governance, their, their finance, um, and where they exist, uh, their anti-corruption programs. Um, and what's emerged from that has been, on the one hand, uh, in certain regards, an, an, a lack of policies 
which has been quite surprising. So um, on our website, all this, this data is hosted, but, but they're, they're frequently um, organizations that simply don't have a, a policy on anti-corruption. And um, it seems that there is a, a sort of a complacency about, about the risk um, and a touch of the are sure it's grand attitude. Um, and, then, and then also on the other hand, where policies do exist, uh, even around, around things like, like whistleblowing, um, our reluctance to share those policies and make, make them public and be transparent about them. Um, and certainly moving beyond that again, it's one thing to have a policy and make it public, but to make public details of how the policy is implemented, monitored, um, and give regular updates on, on its status. Um, and so to, to connect that back to the, the issue here, which is perceptions of corruption, um, the revealing on the other side what, what's being done to preempt and combat it um, will reduce perceptions of corruption. So I think that's the, the main thing I've, I've, I've taken away from it is that, that this um, sometimes, um, you know, and it's not necessarily a, a malevolent desire to hold back this information, but but some sense that it's not it's not really necessary to share if people aren't interested. But actually, in the round, if this information is is made public, it um it's a very straightforward and easy way to to bolster public confidence in in institutions, in companies, and and how they operate. Um, and then, and then similarly, on disclosure and verification and on ongoing reporting um on the politics side. Um, we do uh, have under the existing ethics acts, uh, for instance, uh, registral interests that TDs and senators have to disclose, but those aren't as far reaching as they could be. Um, and so that comes back to this question of, uh, you know, Robert touched on that, but they're probably, you know, there isn't that much corruption out there. People by and large are doing the right thing, but not allowing themselves to be seen to do the right thing. So the level of interest uh, that, that could be disclosed, for instance, loans and liabilities, things like that aren't included in the current uh, ethics act. Um, and then they're also not, not verified under our current system when, when TDs and senators make their returns, it's simply checked that they have made a return, not, what the, not that the content is, is actually accurate. Um, so that sort of thing, while it doesn't actually indicate wrongdoing at all necessarily, it, it also doesn't necessarily make the public confident that the information that we have is 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 proper and correct and um, it's also quite difficult to access that on the basic technological side a lot of this data is uh, siloed across different uh, websites or it's presented in a, in a way that's not that's not searchable and and that can't be easily compared um, and that on, on procurement which Robert also spoke about and the the perceptions around that and um, the the, the, um, the Eurobarometer, uh, a third of Irish respondents believe that there is corruption in, in public tenders in Ireland. And when we were doing the, the last National Integrity Index on uh, semi-states and uh, universities, and in the forthcoming one on, on other public bodies, um, there is a, a lack of information on procurement. Uh, and a lot of the organisations will point to, well, you know, there are EU rules on this and we follow the rules, so isn't, isn't that fine? But again, it's coming back to this this fact of being seen to do the right thing and make that information more accessible, make it clearer at every stage that there is a process, that due process is being followed. Um, and that theme is, is, is across the board, not just the same procurement, but the fact that we don't have, which a lot of countries don't, but a legislative footprint, which Ireland had included in its Open Government Partnership Plan in 2016 and still hasn't implemented. So that would be uh, an online uh, resource where at every stage of the development of a piece of legislation, there would be um, a, a record made public of any uh, submissions, lobbying and so on made, on made on that. Again, some of this information is out there, <clears throat> but it's not comprehensive and it's not um, aggregated together in a way that makes it easy for, it, for the, the public and journalists, civil society and so on to, to see that the right thing is being done where it is being done um, and to shed a light where it's, where it's not being done. Um, and, the, and the importance of that obviously as, as again Robert touched on is, is that if there is a perception of underhandedness it, it corrodes confidence in all of these, these institutions.
so that's the main to come back to your first question john after a long winded response um it's the importance of transparency to um to to bolster public confidence uh where, where the right thing is being done yeah, I, I mean, I know uh, the, the Garda commissioners had this fair share of critics, uh, as most senior public servants do uh, with the profile of a Garda commissioner. But one thing he did do that we very well, much welcomed was acknowledge the risk of corruption inside the Garda. There's been a tendency, I think you'd agree, Catherine, amongst respondents to our research on the National Integrity Index to even admit that it might be a problem. And it affects every organization, uh, irrespective of their sector, whether it be public, private, or nonprofit, whether they're a charity or a public body. People being people, uh, where incentives and opportunities collide, they are just as prone to abuse their position in, in in a charity shop as they are in a a, a, a supermarket or in, in a small company as they are in a, in a public body we need to acknowledge the risk of corruption as as the Garda commissioner did uh, and not see it as an admission or a sign of weakness uh, this is just a fact of life uh, but um, I'll come back to this in a moment again. I, I think one of the one of the points uh, of observations we made in the or that was made in the global corruption barometer is around sixty percent of people, Irish people, believe that public contracts were, were being awarded uh, because of um, personal connections between those awarding the, the the contracts and the recipients. So, as I said earlier, there's there's a great deal to be done to address the suspicion of corruption, irrespective of whether those suspicions are, are well-founded or not. Uh, and as you said, Catherine, we, we need to be far more proactive in sharing information about public contracts, but also about how decisions, our, our policy decisions are being made within, within public bodies. Uh, but Roberto, I'm going to throw you a curveball ball here and ask you why is... <laughs> You might not have an answer, but uh, I know it's probably unfair to ask. But why is the UK still so high up on this thing? After well, everything we've witnessed, why is this still ahead of Ireland? Well, I think, um, I mean, yeah, we, ha we have seen a lot of turmoil in the UK recently. I think tech from, from just a merely technical point of view, I would say, a lot of what we have seen in the UK, especially the latest allegations on Boris Johnson um, and all of the lease scandals that, that happened, um, uh, started to come out after uh, the data collection period for the CPI had passed. So uh, if this is going to be reflected in the score, uh, this is something that uh, I would expect to see um, next year. Um, having said that, I think in many countries like, um, I mean, um, I think it is also difficult, however, to predict how perceptions uh, will work. And I think Robert uh, also uh, spoke about this. Um, and, you know, we could, we could argue one way or another. And in a sense, if these scandals are coming to light, it might also be a positive thing, right? The fact that um, at least the watchdogs are doing their job or uh, the institutions supposed to detect this are doing their jobs. So, um, it is not necessarily a bad thing for scandals to come out, I, I would say. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's worse if we don't see them, right? But uh, it's, it's part of the, the, what is so exciting in a way to, in measuring corruption, right? It's bad if you don't see it. It's also bad if you see it. So you need to, it's, it's always a, a, a thin line there. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I um, we, we talk about preventing corruption as well. And you, and the fact that sometimes scandals are aired is, is, is a sign of a healthy democracy uh, if they weren't coming to public attention it, it would suggest that the media and civil society weren't, weren't doing their job or weren't free to do their job uh, but uh, in the past uh, I've pointed to the the link between perceptions, and you might correct me, Rob or, or, or Roberto, uh, and 
it links it between international perceptions of corruption and the ability of the estate to enforce the law. So I've in the past contracted, it contrasted the, the steps taken by the Hong Kong authorities, for example, uh, who have or who established a, an independent uh, anti-corruption commission back in 1977. Uh, it has a staff complement, total staff complement, that last count of well over 1,100, maybe even 1,500 officers. That's in contrast to the Standards of Public Office Commission, which has around 15 or had the last time I looked. Uh, even, even if you were to combine all of our, the capacity, the, the numbers of, of officers working in, the Garda anti-corruption units, I think they had about three officers there last time I looked. Uh, the Garda National Economic Crime Bureau, the ODCE, they still would be smaller than the Hong Kong Anti-Corruption Commission. So resourcing matters, but also uh, so, does, so does enforcement. And I think it was just late last year that the former immigration minister of Denmark was jailed for 60 days for unlawfully separating uh, underage asylum seekers. She was convicted, sentenced to, 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 to term in prison and lost her seat in parliament. I could not imagine any world in which that happens here, um, where, where a minister abuses their power and is, that, is then convicted of an, an abuse. But if we look, I mean, Rob, we spoke before about uh, Finland as well, uh, where, where where the law is enforced. I remember just a, before I turned to you, Rob, uh, when I was in New Zealand, the former head of Mary TV was was jailed for a number of years for lying on a CV. Uh, I mean, we just don't enforce the law in in the same way here, uh, in respect of or for 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 breaches of. Uh, legislation governing white collar economic crime or administrative law. Uh, Rob, did you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think you're, I mean, you know, we know that deterrence is an effective barrier to, to, to people engaging in corruption. You increase the threat of punishment to at least some extent, people will act less corrupt. Not always, not as much as you want, but in a lot of settings. But, the, you know, as important as expert perceptions of corruption are, um, in terms of how our economy functions. In terms of how our society functions, it's far more important how citizens' perceptions of, of, uh, of, of corruption uh, are. And if, if there's a sense that people can operate with impunity, even if corruption is revealed, uh, as it might be in some of our you know, close uh, friends uh, countries, um, if it's not punished, that's that's destructive to, to, to public trust in the institutions of the government. And if the state doesn't have, people don't have trust in the state, they don't follow its, its rules. Um, again, to, to talk about some research we did in the centre, we showed that parts of the US um, that were more corrupt um, had lower compliance with their shelter-in-place laws. People won't follow the rules and restrictions and even policy advice uh, of a government that they don't trust and if people are seen to be acting with impunity, um, there's no sure way to, to kind of undermine your, your, your democracy than, than allowing that to happen. We can see that there's evidence from all around the world um, in Latin America, North America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Europe, Asia, um, where you have higher perceptions or experiences of corruption, people trust the state less. When people trust the state less, the, the very desirable property of legitimacy is gone. Uh, and it's, you know, people won't take the COVID vaccine. People won't um, pay their taxes. It's, it, it's, it's impunity is, is poison to a country. We, we saw this, in the, the, the much higher death rates in, in uh, Romania and Bulgaria, for example, because of COVID-19 as well. Uh, uh, there's a large, much greater degree of suspicion towards professionals Irrespective of whether they be government officials or doctors, even yeah. uh, in countries with, where, 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 uh, where, where, with much higher rates of corruption, where where it has permeated right through society, where, for example, in Greece, it's quite common uh, to to have to pay or has been common to pay a teacher or a doctor for treatment. Yeah. 
Now, you could see something similar um, in the CSO put out some data late last year, um, and it showed the uptake in the vaccine amongst different groups living in Ireland. And people from the more recent accession uh, countries to the EU had way, way lower uptakes to the vaccine. And I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think that is because they, you know, their formative years were spent in, in growing up in a country um, with more corruption, for the most part, uh, from, from the um, from more recent uh, joiners to the EU. And that has long-standing effects, not just on how you view the government you were born under or the state you were born under, but you view all governments. And that has important kind of public policy uh, implications, you know, by by measuring corruption, by tracking it, by understanding the context in which people have um, formed their views and their perceptions of other things, um, we can, you know, develop better targeted policies to help people to to kind of escape from that mistrust of vaccinations um, and, and so on. Yeah, yeah, and and it just um, I I don't know, Jane, if we have any questions coming through. Um, and sorry, Dan McGinty has uh, commented. Uh, here from the Genie to be to say that the anti-corruption unit has been named or well, renamed the anti-bribery and corruption unit to prevent confusion with the internal anti-corruption unit, which was established by the commissioner, uh, launched by the commissioner last year. So thanks for that, Dan. Um, yeah, I, 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 one point I was, and I've been at pains to make as well, is that uh, we, we, we need to. Um, address any suspicion of the two points I'm going to make um first is that we need to address any suspicion of politicization of law enforcement which you, you very you routinely see in, in in many jurisdictions even suspicions of it are raised routinely in the uk um the met's refusal or a decision not to investigate uh parties in number 10 um has been met with some disquiet shall i say um but also uh, because our, our, our police force has interacted or engaged or is 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 uh, has been answerable in the past to the minister for justice there's always been a suspicion that it's ill-equipped or a, a perception that it's ill-equipped to address uh high level uh crime and particularly at a political or uh, level or within public office and uh, reforms a draft bill is going through or will will, will go through the Oireachtas soon to, to restructure accountability mechanisms in the Gardaí but we have called for a, a, a distinct uh, anti-corruption bureau which would uh, be modelled on, 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 on the criminal assets bureau uh, Rob did you have any thoughts on that yourself or um, I, 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 something has to change anyway, right? So there needs to be more coordination um, across, as you said, the, 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 the multitude of agencies with, with anti-corruption responsibilities, not just cooperation. They, they need to be, um, and not just the cooperation in terms of willingness to work together, but, you know, as we know in Ireland, we don't always have the best uh, computer systems. Uh, in government, there needs to be proper record keeping, proper sharing, information, proper access, proper training. Uh, whether we need a, uh, a kind of an overarching anti-corruption bureau or just closer corrupt, closer corruption, closer collaboration between the institutions we already have, um, I'm, 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 I can see the advantages of a, of a bureau. But if they can start to to pull together more closely, that's a yeah, you know, let's see how that goes first, and they go work way, work their way up to uh, a, to a to a, a bureau. Yeah, I mean, even security specialists have moaned the lack of cooperation between the defence forces and the Guardi and national intelligence, for example. You know, we have a an intelligence military intelligence unit J two, I think it's called now, within the defence forces, and then crime security within the Guardi. But it appears that information isn't readily shared between the two. I mean, it was a an issue for the FBI, I remember, in CIA before 9-11. Um, and we see much greater coordination on national security issues like foreign espionage now in the US than we did in the past. But likewise, I think, Rob, we, we need to see much greater coordination of efforts to uh, detect or, or to, 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 to identify uh, serious corruption risks 
yeah. uh, to, to coordinate a response. So one, I don't think this is all that applicable in Ireland, but one thing we're going to be thinking about in a kind of a, in the context of developing countries in the center for the next couple of years is the idea of interagency trust that for different departments of the same government to work together, if you know the Department of the Environment suspects that the uh, Department of uh, Finance is corrupt or vice versa, it'd be harder for them to work together to, to combat climate change. And I, I don't think that's quite the same issue in the Irish government. I'm sure it's not. But you know, in, I think taking account of, of different cultures within the kind of the culture of anti-corruption uh, and how you can build trust and, and kind of norms of collaboration across different departments is something that needs to be um, uh, thought about more closely. Yeah, and I, I, I'll go, go to Catherine or, and, and or Roberto uh, and ask you, I, I, I've just prefaced the question, I, I, I see a little point in looking down on the table, we need to be looking up and asking what is it that countries like Denmark are doing? Uh, how do we get to Denmark, as, as they say in political science? Um, what are Denmark and New Zealand getting right? Uh, Catherine, did you have any thoughts on this in respect of the work we've been doing so far, or, or, or Roberto more generally? Uh, when, when looking at, at, at the numbers and, and um, uh, drawing any conclusions from them. Um, just um, with the, maybe more the work we've been doing on money and politics than the National Integrity Index, which is obviously very focused just on Ireland. Um, there's a, <clears throat> it seems just a, a higher bar, which is, a truism to say they do well because they do well but um you know looking at, at rules around for instance um revolving doors between the private and public sector there just seems to be a, a much higher benchmark in um i can't remember now off the top of my head we'll say iceland denmark than we have here we have we have um in the regulation of lobbying acts i believe there, there it, it is covered but in a sort of a toothless way that we have seen is is ineffective and um, so it seems in some respects that there's whatever the intention behind it is um half an intention but it doesn't go the full distance maybe um to to really raise the game into that next uh caliber we'll say and um, yeah it's like we're on on the right track but just just stopping short with, with certain measures yeah, yeah. I often I would sometimes point out that Sweden's freedom of information law and the first quasi whistleblower law was introduced in 1766. So they have a much longer track record of of uh, promoting open government than perhaps we do, and um, uh, I think that may have. Uh, impact on the culture, as does their their zero zero tolerance of of um, abuse or misuse even of public office. Uh, Roberto, did you have any thoughts on this? I mean, how do we how does Mexico get to Den to Denmark? Well, that that's going to be a century long <laughs> journey. Um, <laughs> no, I mean what I what I can say. Uh, I mean for the uh, for the case of Ireland, and I think that applies to many of the. Um, of the countries in the European Union that find themselves up or like high in the CPI um, table, so to speak, but not quite there yet, is um, even when we looked at the results of the global, global corruption barometer that we published uh, six months ago or in, in June last year, I think one of the main concerns from citizens was precisely something that both um, Robert and uh, Catherine mentioned already, which was this concern about the like what happens behind the scenes when politics and businesses meet right so what happens with um, um what's happening with public procurement what is happening with policy making and i think this is the um so to speak the next frontier right making this policy making process more transparent more participatory um and also ensuring that um um there is no undue influence on this process from big money from big interests from from um, from yeah from from these interest groups right or that I mean there there can be of course participation from them in the policy making process it's important to inform uh, policy making process but this needs to be done 
um, in a transparent manner. Uh, and I think uh, if we look at the results from the global corruption barometer, we do see that even though um, Ireland is doing quite well in the perception of, well, there's like, you know, a lot of influence of the big business in my government, um, there's still uh, like the Scandinavian countries are still 20 percentage points below uh, what the Irish people believe. So uh, really in Scandinavia, the, the belief that the government is controlled by big interests is uh, much less widespread than it is in most of the rest of the, um, the European Union, including uh, Ireland. Um, and yeah, what, what to do in Mexico? I mean, that is uh, a much more uh, difficult question. I think in that case, we really do need to start with, uh, well, we already mentioned the issue of impunity. So you need to start with uh, making sure that uh, the courts work well. You need to ensure that the rule of law is being applied. You need to shorten the distance between the law that's written and the law of the streets, right? Um, I think shortening this gap uh, is what needs to be done in not only uh, Mexico, but many of the developing countries where um, we have managed to create all of these anti-corruption laws that many of these countries have also passed, but have absolutely no meaning um, because uh, real life looks completely different from what we have now written down in constitutions, international agreements, and so on. So um, I think um, in the next decade, focusing on enforcement in all of these countries uh, would be uh, would be a, a good way to to proceed. Yeah. Yeah. No, thanks, Roberto. I was going to leave you the la with the last word there, but we did get a question in, which I had I've only just seen now, uh, related to uh, public contracting and the pandemic and really asking how transparent where are our process, process for procurement, public procurement around PCR tests, antigen test PPE, vaccines and so on uh, we we haven't heard nearly as many allegations of corruption or uh, cronyism in the award of these contracts as we have in the uk that's not to say it wasn't an issue here we just haven't heard them but we know from the controller and auditor general that there have been as uh, in the past or in the very recent past failures to this to to publish uh, tender opportunities by the HSE, uh, and this is a this is a, an issue which needs to be addressed at a systemic uh, level. At that, we 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 need to have a much greater adherence to public procurement rules, even during an emergency, and we need to plan for the next emergency. As as I've said before, we need to take a risk based approach not just to dealing with a pandemic, but everything connected to it. And that includes planning for procurement of PPE and testing equipment, uh, even when we were, were faced with another crisis as, uh, like the one we faced uh, over the past couple of years. I don't know, we, we got, I don't think we got any other, any other questions. Uh, guys, did you have any concluding remarks, uh, um, Rob? Uh, no, just that. Look, there's 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 a lot of, of work to do globally uh, in the fight against uh, corruption and locally, um, and you know it's important that we 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 keep the the dialogue going, not just once or twice a year when there's new data release, um, but that we. Um, we make this kind of fundamental issue of democratic survival um, something we, we talk about to all of our friends and family for as long as they'll listen to us. Uh, um, Catherine, did you have any any final thoughts? Sorry, um, I suppose maybe just to say, I mean, obviously it's a it's a good performance on the whole, uh, and and things are improving, and we're seeing. Um, you know, commitments in the program for government to, to reforming uh, aspects of legis legislation that, that deal with um, money in politics and uh, lobbying and, and so on. Um, but that unless those really step up and beyond the mark, that we'll continue to hover around this, what is it, 72, 74 kind of score in this particular yeah. index. Um, and that, that really there, there needs to be more ambition to, to, to push reform forward if we're, if we're really going to 
be among what we would like to think of, what Ireland would like to think of as our counterparts um, in Northern Europe. So that's it. Great. Thanks, Catherine. And Roberto, um, I'll leave the last word to you. No, I think my, uh, thank John and, and thanks everybody. No, I think my, my, my famous last words would just be um, uh, hoping that um, Ireland does not grow complacent of its position in the index and continues to work towards, uh, as you were saying, towards becoming Denmark. Um, because I think we have seen what, um, what it looks like when, uh, when you stop uh, doing this, uh, when you put your institutions through a stress test. And we have seen other, like I said, uh, democratic countries that were formerly at the top uh, just fall rapidly on the index over the past few years. And um, I think one of the one of the comments that um, that will I think stay with me um, is what Robert said earlier as well, which is um, it is much easier um, to fight corruption. I mean, it, it is much easier to you know guard good governance when you already have it than to build it back once you lost it. So I think um, that would be. Uh, my my plea, so to speak, to 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 Ireland, the Irish people, the Irish government, to uh, to just not grow complacent, keep working on this, and um, uh, yeah, that's it. You, you took the words out of my mouth, Roberto. Thanks, thanks a million for for joining us, taking the time. I know it was a busy day for you, busy last few weeks. So uh, well done uh, on, on the launch. Uh, thanks again. Thanks, uh, Rob and Catherine as well for for taking part and for our audience uh, too. So uh, we will have a recording of this on our, on our YouTube channel uh, later on today and we'll provide a link to us uh, on, on our, our website if you, you want to find it through there and a link on our YouTube channel to the results too. So uh, log on there, like and subscribe as they say. and. Uh, We'll uh, see you again in a not too distant future. Uh, thanks again. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.